Good morning. Welcome to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church today. It's great to be able to be here with you. Uh, for those of you here in person, it's also great to be able to be streamed also for those who are watching us at home. Uh, so thankful for, these, for this privilege to be able to gather together as a family of faith around God's Word. We're in the middle of the season of Lent, which this year we're, we're thinking of as a season for the sinner, and good news, that's us. Um, that's what we need. We need to hear the good news of our Savior during this season. And today we're, we're thinking of the fact, as it says above there, that God is serious about all of his word. You know, as, as good Lutherans, I suppose, we rightly celebrate the fact that we are saved by grace. Right? It's nothing that we do that earns us heaven. It's only what Jesus did for us. His life and death and resurrection, that's what matters. But that doesn't mean that we then ignore God's commands or no longer try to obey him just because we're saved by grace. No, in fact, just the opposite. As people who are saved by grace, now we are motivated and empowered to serve our God and to see his commands as opportunities to serve him. So that's going to be the focus of our worship today. And we'll begin then uh, as we get a chance to Think about entering God's house here as we join in the hymn, To Your Temple I Draw Near. I invite you to please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let us in true repentance make confession of our sins and receive the assurance of God's forgiveness in Christ. O holy and merciful God, we confess that we are unworthy to stand in your presence. Our hearts are corrupted by sin, and we have broken your law repeatedly in our thoughts, words, and actions, doing the evil you forbid and failing to do the good you command. We are guilty and deserve to be condemned, but we look to your mercy and ask you to forgive us for Jesus' sake. In the words of Psalm 51, we pray, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, 
or repay us according to our iniquities? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, through the perfect obedience and willing suffering and death of Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Wash me and take away each stain. Let nothing of my sin remain. For cleansing through your cross and pain, Christ crucified, I come. And let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 20. And this is the account of, of Moses. He's up on the mountain of the Lord, and God is giving the Ten Commandments. And so we have God speaking the words of the Ten Commandments to us. And again, I mentioned that we're believers saved by grace. God's commands are not what we do to earn salvation. But they're still God's commands. As someone has said before, they're not the ten suggestions. But they're still God's commandments for us that, again, we are not only motivated to follow, but empowered by the Holy Spirit living in us. So we hear these words from Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the, the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is God's word. Now our gospel for today, we, we see kind of an unusual story of Jesus, and maybe it's not that unusual, but it, it it's not what we think of Jesus normally to see him angry and to see him looking almost violent uh, in these sections. And again, it's as a portion of the Old Testament that gets quoted here, it's zeal for his father's house. He recognized that, that people, they were going through the motions in worshiping God. They were using the temple area just as a place to, to, to make money. And Jesus was pointing them back that the whole reason they're here is to Connect to God himself, not to let their selfish, sinful selves get in the way. It's a reminder for us, too. We read from John 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, 
destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Now we'll join in our next hymn, Thy Strong Word.
mercy and peace are yours. From God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word that we focus on this morning is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. And there's enough going on in there. I think it's, it's worth it for us to hear it in full even before we get started here. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness." Dear friends, one of my favorite kind of stories, whether it's a story in in movies or on TV, is the courtroom drama. And maybe you've seen these before. They have, it seems like for every different type of of show or or story there is, there's kind of a version of the courtroom drama of it. Uh, And something about the setting, you know, it's all, there's very definite rules that have to go, you know, in a courtroom, and there's, you know, there's, there's serious stories about it, and there's funny stories uh, about it, and there's, you know, even these classic, even black and white ones, oh, my watch is talking to me, even these classic black and white ones uh, that, that tell these sort of courtroom dramas. And I think sort of the main one that I think of, and it, it's generic enough to fit many of these stories, but you see someone's accused of a crime of some sort. And you see kind of the harrowing experience throughout the story of them having to deal with that accusation, to deal with the witnesses that might be against them. A lot of times there's very negative things about them. Whether they committed the crime or not, there's there's things that come out in the trial that are hard for them to deal with. And usually, if it's a story in a movie or a show, it's it's kind of up and down where you don't know how it's going to turn out. And then sometimes you, you get to the point, and it's the very, you know, the climactic part of the story. They get to the end when the verdict gets read. And sometimes it's, that's the very end of the story. They, they read the verdict, and in some cases, the person is found not guilty. Of course, he's usually celebrating then if he's found not guilty. He's, he's so thankful. He's thankful to the lawyer. He's thankful that, that he got through it. And a lot of times, that's kind of the end of the story. You know, it's, it's sort of a happily ever after. He's not guilty. He goes his merry way, and and things are great. In real life, of course, yes, a a big trial or something that, you know, if you were brought in and you had to go through this, this would be a huge event in your life. And I certainly get that not every movie or show can show people's entire lives. I mean, we just don't have time for that uh, in a movie or a show. But it's probably worth saying that It's not like someone's life comes to an end the day they get their not guilty verdict. I mean, depending on their age, of course, they still got a lot of life ahead of them after that. And it would certainly be kind of sad and wouldn't be a great show, right, if you find out, well, the next week he got in trouble again and this time he was guilty. You'd be like, oh, that kind of ruined the ending. Right, But, but real life, there's a lot of stuff that happens after the not guilty verdict. And that's that's someone's whole life to live. And the reason I'm having us think about that on this Sunday when we're thinking about 
how all of God's word is so important. See, in a way, what we talk about every single week at church is sort of a form of a courtroom drama. But it's not, you know, the actual courtroom and yeah, there's someone in a row, but I'm not a judge, right? But, but what we talk about in church is God's judgment on our sin. We talk about God's law. And we talk about the fact, every single week, we talk about the fact that, objectively speaking, we're guilty. We have sinned. We have fallen far short of what God commands of us. I mean, reading those Ten Commandments, again, we fall short on every one of them. But, again, every week... We rightly rejoice in the fact that because of Jesus, because Jesus lived, died, and rose for us, because of him, we have, well, a not guilty verdict. God isn't holding our sins against us. No, in Jesus, he's won us forgiveness. Right? And because of that, we rejoice. And again, every week, we want to be sharing a version of that. That's good that we do that. We, we need to keep hearing that good news of the forgiveness we have in Jesus. But we know that our life in this world, it's not that as soon as we're forgiven, we go straight to heaven. You know, as soon as you become a believer, you're in heaven right right then. Well, no. There's a lot of life to live, right? Between the time we're a believer and and, and the time we get to heaven. And and how do we live that, that, that whole life of ours? Realizing that the Bible isn't just the declaration of our innocence of Jesus having taken the condemnation for us, but there's still the way we need to live our lives. There's still God's commandments and and what, how he tells us to live and how, how do we make that all work? Well, that's what I want us to talk about this morning and to think about not just hearing that not guilty verdict from our God, not just celebrating our forgiveness, though we should never stop celebrating it, but to also see how, how then do we want to live our lives until he takes us home to heaven? You know, what's, what's our, our full story? And how is our God a part of that story? How is our God the main part of that story? This morning, I want to encourage you to live your full story. And we're doing that uh, through this part of God's word that I read from the book of Romans. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to read the whole thing is because there's a lot going on there. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome, and it's, from what we can tell, it's a church that he hadn't visited yet at the point that he wrote it. And it's possibly because of that that he was very thorough in in the way he wrote it. And he really, he packed a lot into sometimes just a few sentences. He put a lot in there. And our text is no exception to that. And it's worth it for us to really think through this. I suppose it is, you know, you think of legal language often as being, you know, they don't, there's no stone unturned in legal language to the point where it can be hard to understand. In a way, Romans is like that, where there's a lot going on, and it's, it's worth our time to think it through and to think about that, that full story of our, of our life in Christ in that. And so as we start out with this, uh, our text says, Therefore there is now no condemnation, For those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, whenever you start a sentence with therefore, um, it sort of implies that you're talking about something you said before. Right? You should see therefore, you're kind of summing up something you just said. And this is no exception. See, Paul, again, if we're thinking of this as you know, God's case against us, you know, sort of like a courtroom drama. Paul realized when he looked on his life that he had fallen very far short of what God demands. In fact, even as a believer, he realized even when he's trying to obey God's commands, he still messes up. And and chapter 7 of Romans was all about this, and it kind of led up to near the end of the chapter where he says, What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. You know, he just got fed up with it and just said, man, I I try, even when I try not to sin, I still mess up. Who's going to rescue me from this? But then he also gave us the answer. 
Right? Jesus is the one who rescues us. Thanks be to God, who, he said, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right? He recognized that Jesus was the answer, and that's what gets into our text when thinking about how we stand before God. That's why he can say, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That word condemnation, uh, that is very much a legal term. That is kind of like that, that guilty verdict. And kind of like in our court system, this condemnation, guilty verdict, doesn't just imply that, that you did it. It implies that there's punishment involved with condemnation. But, but the good news here, despite the fact that we did it, right? Despite the fact that we're sinful, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? In Jesus... We don't have a guilty verdict. As we talked about, we have a not guilty verdict. And he goes on to, to talk about what that means. For he says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So first he says, you know, what the law, whoops, what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. What he's saying there is, if we tried to please God all on our own, just by obeying the law. Because in theory, that would work. In theory, if you could live perfectly, God on the last day would say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been perfect. Way to go. Problem is, we're born already sinful. And, and our sinful flesh, which is what this is talking about when it says weakened by the flesh, our sinful flesh, our sinful nature, means that we still sin every day. So the law can't be our way into heaven the law was powerless to do it, this says. But how, how did it happen? Well, God did it by sending his own son as a sin offering. So God sent Jesus, because the law wasn't going to get us to heaven, God sent Jesus to be the offering, kind of like the, the Old Testament worship would sacrifice an animal. Well, God sent Jesus to be the sacrifice for sin. He took our sin onto himself and paid for it. Again, our text goes on to, to spell this out for us. Uh, and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So God still had a guilty verdict to give. He still condemned something, but we're told he condemned sin in the flesh. And this is another way of saying the guilty verdict went in the flesh to Jesus. Jesus, who became one of us, he got the guilty verdict. And he got the guilty verdict for all of us. So all our sins were on him, and our sins were condemned in Jesus. So he got the suffering. He paid the price of hell. He did it all so we wouldn't have to, right? So that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. So that God can look at us not as guilty, terrible sinners, but God can see us as holy, precious children of God because Jesus took it, right? That's, that's all about the fact that Jesus has that guilty verdict. And, and again, I've been talking about how we're trying to figure out how to live our full story. And, and yes, our, our full story isn't just this not guilty verdict that we have in Jesus, but have you ever thought about what that means for, for how we live realizing that Jesus has taken the condemnation? I thought one way to put it was this way. Live without guilt because Jesus has taken away your condemnation. Sometimes Christianity, in general, gets sort of talked about of it's all about guilt. Right? They'll say, you know, Christianity wants you to feel bad. They want you to go around feeling bad so that, I don't know, you'll give more or they'll control what you do. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a very cynical way of looking at, certainly, the Bible and, and the Christian faith. But you think about it, because of the reality of what Jesus has done, this can really lift a burden off of us in this time between now and heaven. We don't walk around, you know, moping and just beaten down by the fact that we sin every day and by the fact that it can be frustrating to, to continue to fall in sin. And we know God commands us not to. 
and that they're not the Ten Suggestions, they're the Ten Commandments, and we still fall short, and it could be just this maddening thing that would pull us to despair. But in Jesus, we can live without guilt. We don't have to be weighed down by that. Right? We, can, we can hold our heads high, not because of what we've done, but because we have a Savior who loved us enough to take our punishment in our place. And that God truly does see us by faith as his perfect children. Right? So we can live without guilt. And, and when I say live without guilt, I don't mean in the, in the sense that, you know, sometimes you hear, oh, this food, you can eat it guilt-free. And, and sort of the impression is, eat all you want because it's not that bad for you. And so it's probably worth clarifying that what we're not saying today is, see, sin isn't really that bad for you anymore. So sin all you want. After all, you're forgiven. Well, that's not the point of what we're saying. To get the full story, we, we see how the rest of the text goes on and shows how we treat things like, like sin in our lives now and what it means to us. Our text goes on here in verse 5 when it says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So there's kind of two, two paths that this is talking about. So there's people who live a, uh, according to the flesh and people who live according to the Spirit. And what that is talking about when it says our, our flesh, I mean, flesh is skin, right? But this is, the, the, when the Bible talks about flesh, it's often talking about our sinful nature that's in us from when we were born. It was passed down from great-grandma and grandpa, Adam and Eve, all the way to us, we're sinful, there's that sinful flesh, but we also, as believers, we have a part of us that, that doesn't want to sin, that in fact is controlled by the Holy Spirit who is at work in us. So it's kind of what, sometimes people used to talk about a multiple personality disorder, and, and I think technically that's not the name they use anymore, they, they say something like dissociative identity disorder or something like that, but, but it's this idea that in one person, there's sort of two different personalities at work. And in a way, we could say that about all of us as believers in this sinful world because there's a part of us that has the sinful flesh. Again, it was passed down to us from our parents and all the way up to Adam and Eve. And so, yeah, we do have this sinful flesh. But also as believers, we have the Holy Spirit and they're both at work and sometimes having both of them leads to a struggle. The struggle of, do I do what my sinful flesh wants me to do? Or do I do what the Holy Spirit wants me to do? And, and how do we react to that struggle? How do we live that, that full story of our life? Uh, again, our, our text goes on to talk about it. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So again, God lays out what it looks like. I mean, living according to the flesh doesn't lead to good things. It, it, it leads to death. Whereas, Spirit gives us life. And he goes on to talk about and show that how that sinful flesh shows itself and how it, well, it never leads to something good. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So it says when we're, when we're living according to that flesh, that the flesh never listens to God. It doesn't want to. It sees God as an enemy. It's hostile to him in everything. All right, it's, it's always a bad route to go on. All right, so we know that the answer should be, well, we should go the other way, but how does that actually work? Again, our text goes on to remind us, and I think a way to remember it for us, for our full story, is to live in the Spirit because the Spirit lives in you. So what I'm saying here is we want to live in a way that is, you know, as that struggle goes on, we want the spirit side to win, right? We want the choices of, if the choice is to, do I obey God or do I do what my sinful nature wants to do and sin? Obviously, we want the answer to be to obey God. But on our own, that sounds really hard. And the reminder here for us is how we live this full story is that we're not on our own, the Spirit lives in us. God himself, God the Holy Spirit, lives and is at work in us as believers, and he is the one who can empower us 
to live this way. We're told about it in the last couple verses of our text. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. So it's reminding us we have the Spirit living in us. In fact, you know, you could say, wait, does this say the Spirit lives in us or Jesus lives in us? And really the answer is kind of both because it's saying if Christ is in you, and it says you actually have the Spirit of Christ too. So we have, we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, and that's what empowers us to live our life for God. So any individual situation, there's a time when we're tempted to say, I can't help but sin. Oh, it was too much of a temptation for me. That's actually never the case, right? If it was us on our own, if, it, if all we were was sinful flesh, it would be too much. We would fall every single time. But as believers, we're, we're not controlled by our sinful flesh. No, we, we have the Holy Spirit in us. In us. We have Christ in us working in us he empowers us to live for god right if christ is in you then even though your body is subject to death because of sin the spirit gives life because of righteousness now i'd love to say that we can get to the point where yep we never sin anymore when we get to heaven that'll be the case now unfortunately we still recognize when we fall short But every single day, we have another opportunity to see God's commandments before us and to live according to the Spirit. If we were only our sinful nature, we could never do that. We would miss it every time. But we're not only our sinful nature. God is living in us. The same God who took away our condemnation in Christ has given us His Spirit. And He says, live for Him. Live your whole story. Don't just live in such a way that says, well, I guess I have to sin because nobody's perfect, and so, so why not? No. Live as someone who has been freed from that. You've been set free. You've been given that not guilty verdict. Now live like it. Right? Not because God will get you if you don't. No. God's taken away your condemnation. But because you are forgiven, in thanks to him, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can live your full story out of thanksgiving to what Jesus has done for you. And, yeah, it's not so simple in those courtroom dramas where they say not guilty, and then you say, well, the, and the guy, you know, he gets the not guilty verdict and he lives happily ever after. Who knows what the characters in these stories might do after their guilty verdict? Right, but for us, as God's people, We never want to tire of hearing that not guilty verdict. It means everything to us. It means there's no condemnation. And it means that we get to live in the Spirit. And that, yes, we will leave not just, we will live not just happily ever after, but heavenly ever after in Christ. Amen. I invite you then to please stand as we confess our faith in the triune God. And we do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, 
who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, if you haven't done so, please sign the connect cards that you find on each row. And also those viewing us online can take this time to make sure you've signed into the online connect card also. Thanks. Please stand for prayer. We're going to include in our prayers this morning prayers for Good Shepherd member Jennifer Doolittle, um, whose young cousin, Zach Vole, passed away unexpectedly uh, this past week on March 3rd. So we're going to pray for that family. We'll also pray for Good Shepherd members uh, Karen and her son, Lucas Marks, um, who both uh, underwent surgeries this past week. Karen, uh, a foot surgery, and Lucas... Uh, an appendectomy. So we're thankful that God has brought them through their surgeries and we'll keep them in our prayers also. We'll join in this responsive prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians.
Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Lord, we pray for Jennifer Doolittle and her family uh, as they mourn the loss of Jennifer's young cousin, Zach Vole. Lord, we know that you're the, the Lord of life and death. And when people die in faith in you, you bring them to their eternal home in heaven through your Son. But Lord, it's also a struggle for those left behind, especially uh, when the person who died is young. Lord, help uh, Jennifer and her family to, to think through what has happened uh, and to try to understand what possibly can't be understood on this side of heaven. Comfort them. Remind them of what Jesus did uh, for young Zach and, and, and winning him eternal life in heaven. And then be with them in the days and weeks that follows. Be, be with the family uh, and continue to build them up in the strength that only you can give them. Lord, we also come to you in thanksgiving on behalf of Karen and Lucas Marks. We thank you that you have watched over them in the surgeries that they went through this week. We thank you for giving skill to the, to the surgeons and, and doctors and nurses who took care of them. And we ask you to continue to be with them and to strengthen them, not only physically uh, as they recover from these surgeries, uh, but also spiritually as you continue to come to them in your word, uh, your word of forgiveness and your word of power uh, to build them up spiritually now and always through your Son, our Savior. And we all, Lord, we also ask you to hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which was given for you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. For those who will be coming to God's table today, we in, will invite you to come forward in individual or family groups by continuous flow. Um, on this side, we'll, we'll start here and work our way back and then move on to here. And we'll, we'll come and work our way this way. And then there's the, the garbage basket for the cup. I know there is hand sanitizer before and after. And then again on this side, uh, we'll start here and work our way back and then move on to here and work our way back. And again, work our way from this side over to there. Hand sanitizer's there. The garbage is there. Um, we're not in a rush. Uh, we can keep a, a nice distance between individuals and family groups. And we invite you to God's table as all things are now prepared.
May this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. And please stand for our closing prayer. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And you may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us in word and sacrament. Thankful that you can be with us. Thankful, again, that those uh, can view us online streaming who are able to do that. A uh, couple of announcements. We're still in the season of Lent. We still have midweek Lent services. Um, the live version here is at 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday afternoons, uh, and then that will be available to view online by 6.30 or 7, certainly, uh, for those who would, wouldn't be able to make it that early and be able to watch it then. So be aware of that. Also, uh, with the different calls out in our congregation, uh, we, we do know the answers on these. Uh, Justin and Rachel Hansen have returned their calls to St. John's School in Nodine, Minnesota. Um, this is their letter to the congregation. Dear fellow members of Good Shepherd, a few weeks ago we received calls to serve at St. John's Lutheran School in Nodine, Minnesota. This has been a great opportunity for us to look at the gifts we have been given and to see if they would be a better fit here at Good Shepherd or at St. John's. We want to thank all of you who reached out to us during this deliberation time. Thank you for your thoughts, words of encouragement, and prayers. We have prayed and thought about the two calls and have made the decision to return our calls to St. John's and to continue serving with you here at Good Shepherd. We are excited about the future ministry of Good Shepherd, and we will keep in our prayers the members of St. John's Nodine as they look to fill their teacher vacancies for next school year. In Christ, Justin and Rachel Hansen. And then also Leah Samuelson. Leah Samuelson has accepted her call to Cross of Christ School in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. And this is her letter to our congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what a privilege to witness God's love in action. And that is what this deliberation process has done for me. I see God's hand at work at both Good Shepherd Lutheran and Cross of Christ Lutheran. It has been an exciting couple of weeks learning of new ministry opportunities while also reflecting on our current ministry opportunities. What an awesome God we serve. Over the, past, over, the, over the course of these past weeks, through prayers, conversations, and much thought, I have decided to accept the call to serve at Cross of Christ Lutheran. 
This decision has been a difficult one, but I rest in the assurance that decisions made in faith are covered in God's promises. He promises to carry out his will. He promises to bless his children. Please pray for both congregations during this time that I am able to serve diligently at Cross of Christ and that the Lord bless his good shepherd through this transi transition in preschool staff. As I have appreciated your thoughts, prayers, and conversations during my deliberations, I will continue to cherish continued prayers and discussion over the coming months. In Christ, Leah Samuelson. So, uh, the decisions have been made, uh, which it's nice to have those behind us. Um, definitely reach out to Leah and also Justin and Rachel about those decisions. And again, keep praying for all the con uh, congregations involved. Uh, with that, I'm forgetting something. I, I don't know if you have. Oh. Ah. Two weeks from today, 6.30 p.m., kind of a continuation of what was brought forward end of uh, January, so January 31st, looking at special finances that subcommittee has done their work, and the leadership team has some recommendations to present. Okay, yeah, so that meeting is two weeks from today, you said, which is what, March? 21st. March 21st, and I believe, it, is it 6.30 p.m., did you say? 6.30 p.m., again, mostly done via Zoom. Um, so more information coming, but uh, be aware of that in two weeks. With that, God's blessings. Uh, rejoice in your not guilty verdict and live um, that full story that God has given for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.